All right, so I'm recording this lesson. Um, I'm gonna teach us some kind of brand new things right at the beginning, but in a little bit, I'll need some help. So make sure that you help me out if I ask, or if you have a question, make sure that you let me know. We're in lesson 5-1, so we're talking about the mid-segments of triangles. This is a new concept, but it's using an old concept that we already know. So mid-segments is a new word, but what's not a new word are midpoints. So we've done midpoints before. It says X is the midpoint of AB. So X is the midpoint of AB. That means that X is halfway between um, A and B, and so the segment between them um, a to X is the same as B to X. Same idea on the other side for B. B is, or sorry, a Y. Y is the midpoint of BC. So the distance from B to Y is the same as C to Y. This is not necessarily the same from BY to BX, but we know that these two are congruent to each other um, while the other two a, X, and B, X are congruent to each other. That's just some basic reminders of midpoints. But I reminded us about midpoints because midpoints are what makes up this new word that we lear are learning today, the mid-segment. So when you connect two midpoints of two sides of a triangle, that creates a segment called the mid-segment. And the way I remember it is midpoints make up mid-segments. So again, not that creative in geometry. You could um, draw another midpoint. We didn't put a midpoint between AC. So I've got a midpoint right here. We could call that Z. And then that means I can connect the midpoints of ZY and ZX. And that would give us a total of three mid segments in a triangle. So every triangle has a total of three mid segments. When you take those three midpoints and connect them all together in groups of two, then that gives us three mid segments. Again, we're just learning some basics right now, some vocabulary. Now I'm gonna teach you two theorems or two, I guess, relationships that come with the mid-segment. So the mid-segment I'm focusing on here, the mid-segment I'm focusing on here is XY, and the side that it's across from is AC. So there's special relationships between the mid-segment and then the side across the triangle, the side of the triangle that's not connected to either of the midpoints. The first thing that's special is that the mid-segment is parallel to the third side. They will never ever touch, they will never ever cross, they are parallel to each other. So the mid-segment is parallel. The other thing that's special, first is that they're parallel, second is that the length of the mid-segment is half of the length of the third side. So if I said that AC was 10, half of that is how long XY is, which is five. So if you go from the long side, the third side to the short, the mid segment, we would divide by two. But you could also go the other way, and that would be times two. So five times two is 10. The mid segment times two is the length of the third side, or the other way around, the length of the third side is half divided by two of the mid-segment. So I wrote that out in one and two in words. Let's put it in symbols below that. So my summary of this is XY is parallel to AC. And my other summary is that the length XY is equal to one half of AC. Remember AC is like a full length. It's not like one half times A and one half times C. It's like this full length. Now, if you're like, Miss White, I'm not a huge fan of fractions. I'm not gonna remember that. You could also move it around. Instead, we could multiply by two on this side and two over here to get, the, um, get rid of the fraction. And so this is also the same thing as two times XY equals AC. Again, XY is the segment. They mean the same thing, but you have to decide which one you're going to remember. It's either the mid-segment is equal to half of the third side or two times the mid-segment equals the third side, whichever way you want to think it. Okay, any questions so far? 
All right, let's go continue on. We've got this example, this picture. I've kind of used the same picture, uh, just carrying it down the page with us. Now we've got these questions that are going to help us explore about it, and I'm going to need some help on these. We're going to talk through these. So letter A says, how do we know that X, Y, Y, Z, and Z, X are all mid-segments of a triangle ABC? How do we know X, Y, Y, Z, and X, Z are all mid-segments? Does anyone know? How do I know that those are all mid-segments? Is it because they're inside of the triangle? Like inside ABC? That's part of the reason. What else is special about these segments? What are, what are they made up of? What are points X and Y and Z? What are those points? A triangle. They are part of a triangle, but how are they, um, or what are they, I guess, in triangle ABC? What's the name of X in triangle ABC? Miss White, is it because like they're all a midpoint of a line? That's what I want, yes. We were kind of working all our way around it, but right in the middle, Abby, is what I want. The midpoint was the special word I was looking for. So X and Y and Z are all midpoints. So we know that they're mid segments because separately X, Y, and Z are all midpoints. And midpoints make up mid segments. We also know that they're midpoints because of all the congruent marks. So X is a midpoint because BX and AX are congruent. Y is a midpoint because BY and CY are congruent. And Z is a midpoint because AZ and CZ are congruent. And so we know that they're midpoints because of the congruence marks. Very good. Okay. So now we've determined that X, Y, Y, Z, and Z, X are all mid segments because X, Y, and Z are midpoints. Now, how is X, Y related to AC? How is X, Y related to AC? I'm looking for two things here. Parallel. Parallel, very good, Griffin. They are parallel to each other. So X, Y is parallel to AC. Good, what's the second thing I'm looking for? Anybody? How else are X, Y, and AC related? X, Y is equal to half of AC. Very good, Donna. Griffin reminded us of the first part of the theorem, and then Donna looked back and saw the second part, so she knows that X, Y is equal to one half of AC. Good, that's kind of like the big overriding idea that I'm teaching you today is that mid segments are parallel to the opposite side and are one half of the opposite side. Awesome. Okay. Now we're going to switch looking at a different mid segment. So we just looked at X, Y, and AC. Now we're looking at X, Z, but we're talking about not the whole segment BC, but we're talking about BY and CY. How is X, Z related to BY and CY? Aren't they um, congruent? All three of them are congruent. Why do you know that, Maddie? Um, because of the congruent marks. Good, we know these two are congruent because of the congruent marks. Why do you also know that I should put two congruent marks here? I think you're right, I just wanna know why. Third angle theorem? Um, not third angle theorem. So let's build off of this. Maddie told me BY and CY are congruent, and I agree with that because we've got congruent marks. Building off of what Donna was just telling us, we know that the mid segment is equal to one half of the entire opposite side. So if I know that XZ is equal to one half of BC, well, we also know that BY is equal to one half of BC, right? Because Y is in the middle. So we also know that BY is equal to one half BC. 
And we also know that CY is equal to one half of BC. Because again, Y is the midpoint. So if I go from the end point to the midpoint, that's halfway through. And so Maddie was correct, but I wanted to make sure that we all understood why Maddie was allowed to say that. All three of these are congruent because they are all one half of BC. They are all the same length based on what we know about midpoints and then what we just learned about mid segments. So and, um, I'm gonna write over here, I'm gonna say XZ is congruent to BY, which is congruent to CY. That being said, I'm also allowed to say that the other parts are congruent. So like AX and BX is congruent to YZ. So I'm gonna put one little congruent mark on YZ. And then I can also do that for XY with AZ and CZ. So that should have three congruent marks. So these guys are congruent to each other, but not necessarily to anything else. These guys are congruent to each other, but not necessarily anything else. And then these guys are congruent to each other, but not necessarily anything else. That's helpful because the next question says, are there any congruent triangles in this diagram? Anybody see any congruent triangles? A, X, Z, and um, Z, Y, C. Very good. So Griffin even named it for me. He told me this triangle right here and this triangle right here are congruent. I would argue all of the little triangles are congruent. Why did we know that those two triangles were congruent or why do we know all of the triangles are congruent? What of my five theorems tells me that these angles are congruent? Hey, there's no way, there's no goddamn way. Side, side, side. Side, side, yeah. side. Side, 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 very good. So I'm gonna say all four of the small triangles are congruent. And I don't know who helped me, but thank you by side, side, side. I didn't mark any angles, but I marked all of my sides and all my sides are congruent. So my side, side, side. All right, the next two questions are about perimeter. So I'm going to erase some of this nonsense I've got in my picture. Remember that perimeter is talking about um, all of the sides together. So perimeter is when we add all the sides. So if I have the perimeter of this, I want to know how it's related to the perimeter of ABC. Does anybody already have an idea on how those two perimeters might be related? How are those related? If I know that XY is one half of AC, okay, that's cool. I also know all of the other segments are that same thing too, right? YZ is half of AB. XZ is half of BC. So if I'm thinking about the entire perimeters, how is the perimeter of XYZ, the pink triangle, related to the triangle of ABC, the yellow one? Would you do um, XYZ equals half of ABC? Awesome, Maddie. Perimeter, and I'm just going to use a P just so we know what we're talking about. I'm going to say perimeter of XYZ is equal to one half of the perimeter of triangle ABC. So since we know each segment is half of the other one, well then if I were to add all of them up, they're still half of the other ones. So the entire perimeter is half of the big perimeter. If I just give us perimeter like I do in the next problem, we don't have to figure out what all the side lengths are and match them up and blah, blah, blah. We can just know as a total the perimeter, how it's related to the other one, whether I give you the big one and you find the small one or vice versa. So the letter F says, if the perimeter of XYZ is 36, then what is the perimeter of ABC? The perimeter of XYZ is 36. What's the perimeter of ABC? How do I find it? Mm 
divided by two. Um, X, Y, Z, should I divide that by two? That would give me a smaller. Multiplied by two. Good. And that's the thing that's, I, I personally can't keep track of it. I had a hard time when I was a student like you to know whether I was multiplying or whether I was dividing. And so sometimes I was like, okay, well, if I have this number and I divide it, that's going to be smaller. Is the yellow one smaller? Nope. So then I reverse it. So very good. That's a very common mistake. And we multiply it by two since I gave you the smaller one. And that gives us 72. And so that's the perimeter of angle or triangle ABC. Awesome, good job so far, guys. Anybody questions, comments, concerns? All right, let's jump into the next problems. These last two problems on this page, or last three problems, excuse me, on this page. These are using our idea of mid-segments. So on the left box, it says um, AB is the mid-segment, find the value of X. If AB is the mid-segment, then what are A and B? What do we call A and B? Midpoints. Midpoints, very good. Midpoints. So if they're midpoints, how are DB and EB related to each other? They're congruent. They're congruent, very good Griffin, they're congruent. DB is congruent to EB because they're split by B. B is in the middle, so that means that I get to know that that is congruent to this. If they're congruent, we just get to set them equal to each other. X minus seven equals two X minus 17. Now we've got ourselves an algebra one equation. Bring all the variables to one side, bring all the constants to the other side and then solve. So minus X add 17. 10 equals X. Oh, perfect. That was easy. It just says find the value of X, so I don't have to do any more work from that. I found X, that was it. Any questions so far? All right, the next one, the same idea is happening. I still have my midpoints of A and B. A, B is my mid segment. However, we don't get to set something equal to each other. If we did, it would have to be BT and um, BS, but we don't have those segment lengths. And, or it would have to be RA and SA, but we also don't have those segment lengths. So how do I know, or I guess my question is, how are AB and RT related to each other? Isn't it, um... AB is half of RT. But AB is equal to half of RT. So Maddie knows that the, the mid-segment is equal to one half of the third side. You could also do it the other way where we did two times AB equals RT. Either way is correct. And this is the way I usually start by setting it up. So we'll leave it here. Now we're gonna plug in our pieces. I've got two X plus five equals one half of three X plus 15. Now, what we might be blindly tempted to do is just multiply by my one half, but we're gonna get decimals and sometimes that leads to mistakes. What I would rather do is what I call clear the denominator. So if I multiply this whole side by two, then the one half and the two would cancel. So I would just be left with three X plus 15. And I would multiply two by the other side and I would distribute two to everything over here. 4x plus 10. The reason that's helpful is that I don't have a decimal and sometimes we make mistakes on decimals that we don't make when we have whole numbers. So we're just making it as clear for ourselves to set this up. Is everyone okay with me clearing the denominator and multiplying by two? Once I do that, then I want to combine terms. So I minus 3x from both sides. I minus 10 from both sides. And I get x equals 5. And that's it. x equals 5. Any questions, comments, or concerns? All right, let's jump to the next one. We got one more, and then we're going to go to the back side. This one says, given J is the midpoint of KL, okay, 
J is a midpoint of KL, got it. And H is a midpoint of KM. H is a midpoint of KM. What does that make JH? What do we call JH if J is a midpoint and H is a midpoint? What's the vocab word for JH? Mid-segment. Mid-segment, very good, it's a mid-segment. That's what we learned today. So JH is my mid-segment, okay. And I don't know if it's easy or not to tell, but that X goes with JH. So that X is referring to the length JH. And the first question says, find the value of X. Ooh, how do I do that? How do I find X? Isn't it um, half of X equals, I mean, half of 30 equals X? Very good. Um, X equals one half of 30. And so in order to find X, we just divide by two. So X equals 15. So that's my segments. The next problem is an angle problem. You're probably like, Miss White, I haven't even seen angles on this whole paper. Where is she coming with this stuff? We got it, we can do this. What we did talk about, even though we didn't explicitly talk about angles is we talked about being parallel. So. I say this often, but like we can't forget what we've already done. So we did parallel lines back in unit three, and so I'm bringing that back. We know that JH and LM are parallel because mid-segment is parallel to the side opposite it. I can also make this other line that we have here a transversal from K to L or J to L or whatever you wanna call it. I've got a transversal here, so now, I've got two parallel lines and a transversal. We saw a ton of these back in unit three. The reason that's helpful is I told you measure of angle L is 80. So that's this angle right here. 80 is right there. And I wanna find measure of J L, or sorry, L J H. L J H is this angle right here. So my question is how are those two angles related? Consecutive interior angles. Consecutive interior angles, very good. If you didn't remember, we had like seven types. We had linear pairs, vertical angles, and one of them was consecutive interior angles. And if we remember all the way back to our theorems, if lines are parallel, then consecutive interior angles are what? Supplementary. Supplementary, very good. They're supplementary. If these angles are supplementary, then what is the measure of LJH? What is that measure of that pink angle? 100. 100, awesome. We do 180 minus 80, or you can say 100 equals 80 plus whatever. We minus it off and we get 100. So even though we haven't done angles before, we can remember what we know about parallel lines and consecutive interior angles and being supplementary and find out that it's 100. Great job, guys. Any questions so far? Okay, let's jump to the back side. Now I know you were like, Miss White, you're asking a lot for us to remember chapter three. Well, now I'm gonna ask even more because I need us to remember chapter one. We have midpoint, slope, and distance. We did that back in like 1718. I'm gonna assume that you don't have those just on like the tip of your tongue right now, so I'm gonna remind you what they are, but hopefully this should be like a nice like reminder and you remember doing this. So remember midpoint is where we average the X's and average the Y's. X is added together divided by two, Y is added together divided by two. It gives us a point, a midpoint, and it's a coordinate, and so we might use that in the next problem. And I'll zoom back out when I'm all done with these, but I'm gonna write them all down first. The next one was slope, and you guys did that a ton in Algebra 1. Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. Minus the Y's minus the X's. The biggest mistake I see is when people put the X over the Y. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Make sure you do the rise, which is the ups and downs, over the run, which is left and right. So it's y's over x's. 
And then last is distance. And again, I believe you did this in Algebra 1, but I know we did it at the very beginning of the year. We minus our x's, square them, minus our y's, square them. It's all under big radical. So let me zoom out so you can see all of them. Make sure you have yours written down. And the reason I brought these up is because we're literally about to use them in the next three problems. I'm giving us coordinates, so we're gonna draw a triangle on like an actual graph, not just like in floating space like we've been doing. And I'm gonna ask us to find some midpoints, so we're gonna need the midpoint formula. I'm gonna ask us to show that these lines are parallel. Well, being parallel has to do with our slope. And then lastly, I'm gonna ask us to know distance, and distance is whenever I show you like two letters without hats on top of them. So if it's like L, um, NP like this, where there's nothing on top, it means that we're doing distance. So I'm gonna actually write that next to them just so I don't forget. Those mean distance. Okay. Before we do that though, let's graph them, okay? So we have to graph these coordinate points. If I were to test you on this, I would give you a graph so that it looks as nice as possible. But right now we're just, you know, doing our best estimation and trying to keep it as straight as possible. Two, three, four. So again, I'm just sketching. I've got K is at two, three. Remember that you do your X before you do your Y. So we go left and right, and then we go up and down. So I went over two, up three. Then I'm going to negative two, negative one. Again, I'm not to scale, so this might not be perfect. And then I'm going to five, one, which is M. Okay, perfect. We doing okay so far? Okay, so I've got my graph. I know exactly which formula I'm using. I color coordinated and I looked for keywords. So the first one says find the coordinates of N, the midpoint of KM. Well, that means I'm gonna go use my midpoint formula. So I'm going to write it down here just because I don't like to keep scrolling in and out. That makes me a little seasick, I feel like. So I've got X1 over X2 divided by two um, and then Y1 plus Y2 divided by two. And I'm using for N, I'm using K and M. So I'm using these two, K and M. So I'll do my X's first. So I will do um, two and five. So two plus five. And then I'll do my Y second. So I'll do three and one. We start simplifying, two plus five is seven, four plus, or three plus one is four. So I've got seven over two and four over two. You can make them decimals, go for it. Um, you can also leave them as fractions, whatever makes you happy. Um, seven over two is 3.5, and then four over two is two. So my first point, N, is at 3.5 over two, or sorry, 3.5 comma two. So if I were to graph that, that'd be about here. And again, I didn't draw a perfect graph, but it looks about at the midpoint. Now we have to do the same thing with P. So again, I'm using the same formula, x1 plus x2 over two, y1 plus y2 over two. Again, it's just plugging and chugging. This time though, P says it's the midpoint of L and M. So I'm going to use L and M, not K and M this time. So my X's are negative two and five. And my Y's are negative one and one. 
Everyone doing okay so far? Anybody have any questions? Make sure you tell me if you do. I simplify and I get three over two and then zero over two. So that becomes 1.5 and zero. Cool, a new point. So I'm gonna go graph 1.50, which is about here, which looks pretty good. So those are my midpoints, which means that they make a mid-segment. My next two problems are dealing with NP and KL and with NP and KL. So I am basically focusing on these two lines for the rest of this problem, KL and NP. Any questions so far? The next part, part B says, show that NP is parallel to KL. Ooh, what does it mean for lines to be parallel? If lines are parallel, what do we know about their slopes? They're the same. They're the same, very good. Parallel lines have the same slope. Awesome, very good, Allie. Same slope. And so all I want to do is show that the slope for NP is the same as the slope for KL. So I'm going to do my slope for NP. I'm doing my Y1 minus Y2 over X2 minus X1 and see that that's the same as my slope for KL, which I'm also using the same formula. Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. I am going to rewrite my points down here so I don't have to keep zooming in and out. So I've got 3.52 and 1.50. Feel free to label them your x1, y1, and x2, y2. And then again, I'm just going to plug them in. y2 is 0 minus y1 is 2 and then x2 is 1.5 minus x1 which is 3.5. 0 minus 2 is negative 2 and then 1.5 minus 3.5. Oh that's a nice solid number. That's just negative 2. Oh and that divides evenly. Negative 2 divided by negative 2 is 1. Awesome. Not too bad. Now I'm going to jump to KL. So that's the points 2, 3, and negative 2, negative 1. And I'm going to do x1, y1, and x2, y2. Again, some of us might be really comfortable plugging these in. So I'm assuming you're just, you know, chugging along on your own. If you need any help or you're like kind of confused how I'm doing any of this, please, please, please ask me whether it's now or outside of class. This is kind of an algebra one concept, the plugging into slope. And so I'm not going very slowly over it, but I'd love to explain it further if need be. I plugged in my points. Now I simplify negative one minus three is negative four and negative two minus two is negative two. No, negative two minus two is negative four. And then when I divide it, oh, it also equals one. Perfect, that's exactly what I wanted. I wanted these to be equal. That's awesome, perfect, check. I just showed that they were parallel because I showed that they have the same slope. Okay. Any questions so far? All right, my last problem is my distance. So I'm gonna do distance of NP and of KL. So I'm gonna do NP. That distance is x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. I'm going to use the same points I used above. And I'm keeping mine color coordinated so I know exactly what I'm doing. And so hopefully you guys can follow along pretty easily too. Um, x2 is 1.5 minus x1, which is 3.5 squared. And then y2 is 0 minus y1 is negative 2, or it's just positive 2. Okay. 
that becomes 1.5 minus 3.5 is negative 2 squared. And then 0 minus 2 is also negative 2 squared. You can put parentheses around these, or you can just remember you're squaring all of it. If we're squaring it, there's no negatives. It's always going to be positive. So negative 2 squared is going to be positive 4. And then negative 2 squared is also positive 4. I'm not going to make you put parentheses around it, but if you make little mistakes like that, I encourage you to put parentheses around it just to keep yourself in, in line. 4 plus 4 is going to be 8. Oh, but we're not done because we can factor tree. 8 goes down to 2 and 4, and 4 goes to 2 and 2. And when there's a pair of numbers, we get to take it out. So I get 2 root 2. Cool. Now we have to do KL. I'm not just going to do KL. I'm going to do one half of KL because I want it to equal that 2 root 2. So I'm going to make sure I carry that one half with me throughout the whole thing. So I'm going to do one half of my distance formula, x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. I've got x2 is negative 2 minus 2, and then y2 is negative 1 minus 3. I'm going to keep that one half out front. Negative 2 minus 2 is 4, or negative 4 squared, and then negative 1 minus 3 is also negative 4. Again, put parentheses if you're going to make, make a mistake with your signs, but we know everything squared is positive. So I've got 1 half of 16 plus 16, which becomes a big root 32. And then I do my factor tree for 32. So the first factors I think of are 4 and 8. So 4 becomes 2 and 2, but 8 becomes 2 and 4, which is also 2 and 2. I don't just have one two on the outside, I now have two twos on the outside, which is two times two or two squared, which is four root two. Oh, and I can factor, I can divide by two, and that gives me two root two. One half of four root two is two root two, which is equal to that, which is awesome. That's what I want. They are equal to each other. Okay, how did you get four root two? Remember when you take out, when you have two numbers um, in a radical, then you can take out one of them. So I had two times two, and then I had two times two. So I didn't just take out two and leave the other two on the inside. I've got a second two outside. Does that help, Charlie? Um, Miss. Yeah, Ms. a little White. bit. Mm -hmm. Maddie? Um, why did you put half? Great question. The beginning said that show that NP is equal to one half of KL. And so I wanted to do what one half of KL was to show that it equaled what I got from NP. Okay. Does that help? Yeah. Cool. Miss White, will you explain how you got four again? I'm just a little confused on that. Yeah, so I'm sped through our factor tree because I know that we've done it before. Remember when we factor 32, you just bring all the factors down. So I had four and eight. So I got two and two. And then I got um, eight became two and four. And that four broke down to two and two. Anytime that you have a pair of numbers, you square that and it comes on the outside. So these two together bring one, two on the outside of the radical. These two together bring that two on the outside of the radical. And then my two in this box stays under the radical because he doesn't have a pair. Then I multiply these twos together and that gave me my four right there. Okay, thank you. Does that help more? Yeah. All right, any other questions we have? Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna stop recording. And um, if you need me, I'll be on the flex.